Our next radar site was at a quarry site at the top of a cliff at Cap Couron, which had been used by the Germans with coastal defence guns. The guns had been spiked in a hurry, and in a cave nearby were hundreds of shells and their silk-covered propellant plastic bags of cordite. The shelf had been quarried for its valuable blue stone, which had been pushed over the cliff onto a narrow beach below, hundreds of feet below, for use in the mun municipal buildings at Marseille. Our radar trucks could just fit on the flat shelf, but the diesels were back near the road at the limit of the power cables. As we were very far from our billets at Sauce les Pins, snacks and drinks were a problem and we had to boil water in a dixie. The fire underneath was a pile of cordite sticks that we'd emptied out of the silk bags. We piled it up, we parceled up the, uh, the silk bags to send home. Winter was approaching. We had lots of low cloud, rain and strong wind. So I rolled blue stone boulders near to the aerial to use as anchors. When the mistles started to blow down from the Rome Valley, I tied ropes from these stones to the aerial to stop it blowing over the edge of the cliff. One very bad night when I was up at the site, the power and the lights began to flicker. I went outside to check things. The diesel sounded okay. The cables under the, tr under the trucks were fine. Then I noticed shadowy, shadowy figures down by the road. When I shouted, they disappeared. The next night, I came on duty with my Sten gun and several clips of bullets. As it got dark and misty, I was ready for any action. The lights flickered as I expected. I went outside quietly, loaded my gun and fired and sprayed several bullets high above the diesels into the darkness and the shadows disappeared. As the war in Europe was coming to a conclusion, there was a large movement of personnel, some ready for demob, some going to the Far East, and a few new replacements. A new sergeant came to 15051 from England, full of the latest ideas on radar and its operations, but with no experience of the problems that we'd had in the field with bullets and weather extremes. His ideas of care of the power valves and diesel lubrication didn't coincide with mine, and I said so. We never had a serious breakdown all the time I'd been looking after these things. Everything that broke down, I managed to fix somehow or other. But the new ideas were accepted by the commanding officer, and I had to go. I went with the thought that the diesel pump on the diesel diesels would soon be worn out if it wasn't looked after properly. My transfer to 871 was a blessing in disguise. I remained at the Agricultural College at La Crow, north of the airfield at Easters, for many months, while 15051 moved west to Set. Later, it was given to the Free French Radar Forces and disbanded. Nick came to 871 and the rest of the men were scattered around to various Air Force units in Italy, the Balkans and North Africa. A new commanding officer at 871 and I became good friends. He was a young Canadian from Toronto and about my age. In our spare time, we drove around southern France in his private Peugeot car, visiting all the local towns and places of interest, until eventually 871 was given to the French, and I was posted to a large maintenance unit in Malta to check radar on planes flying from Europe to the Far East. The move from 871 to Malta was a lucky posting for me. I went to the transit camp at Soulon to wait for a flight to Malta. In the sergeant's mess there, I met many interesting men. 
and made friends with some soldiers leaving from the British army who were going to Palestine to help in the struggle of the Jews to establish a new state of Israel in the Middle East. The flight to Malta was in a converted Wellington bomber, a Wimpy, which is very interesting. Previously, I had driven up and down the west coast of Italy in the convoy, but this time it was by air, and I, re I retraced my journey in daylight, and memories were recalled of Ischia, Capri and Sicily as we flew over them. Malta soon appeared as a sandy blob in the distance. Then, later, I could see tiny patches of green. These are the fields. Our Wempy touched down in the centre of the island at Lucca. Lucca is an extension of the airfield at Safi, where I was about to work on a great variety of planes flying onto the Far East. I'd never been on an operational airfield before, like the one at Safi, with the added attraction of a flying boat terminal by the sea at Califrana. Although I lived near the base, there was little bull. Everybody was so busy, and none at all at Safi airstrip in the scorching midday Malta heat. My billet was near the sergeant's mess by the sea, so swimming was possible every day. Social life was good. With my special engineer friend Tom, we used to use all the sports facilities on the base and made frequent trips by bus into Valletta for shopping, cinema, theatre and restaurants. I had my first leave in 1943 from Malta to England. I also had several flights over the weekend to Catania in Sicily. This made a nice break up to Tarmina on the opposite side of Sicily from the jailer plane where we started operations. I shared a billet with the Safi technicians, mechanics, engineers and radio staff, and the test pilot, who tested each plane after it had had it been serviced and had a refit. I found out early on about the, the flight tests and went along as ballast, often with men from the Navy as the Fleet Air Arm airfield at Halfar was quite close to Safi, and of course, Tarmina was a favourite destination for a weekend. After VE Day, with the prospect of jobs in Sibby Street, the RAF brought office education officers to California to hold courses of study in many subjects, particularly in maths, French, German and English. I did them all to improve in my marks in my school certificate subjects. I shared my desk in one of the lecture rooms in language, in language classes with the same man. We became good friends and I helped him particularly with his German as he expected to go to Germany as a regular airman. Before the exams took place, he asked me to help him in my spare time at his billet somewhere up the hill near the officer's mess. On my first trip up the hill, I had to ask an MP for help and mention this chap's name. He escorted me very, very quickly to the right place and told me my German-speaking friend was the commanding officer of California. I wasn't overly concerned as a group captain. He was not as important as my pal in Algiers, General Eisenhower. We both got on very well and passed our examinations with flying colour. Later on, after I'd been demobbed, I heard that he'd gone to Germany as he expected. <laughs>